For conversation, information, and revelation, it's the Politocrat Daily Podcast with me, Omar Moore. Subscribe now and spread the word. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Politocrat. I am Omar Moore. It is Tuesday, December the 22nd. 2020. On this edition of The Politocrat, part two of the Stimmers Bill, a look at the House and Senate vote last night, plus a question. What if poor and working class people were the ones in Congress. Where do you think we would be right now with this stimulus bill and a whole host of other things? That's the question that I'll be asking you to ponder on this edition of The Politocrat. Welcome back. Just a couple of things before going into the main things on this episode. It is so interesting to me now that in the United Kingdom, as we are now some nine days, I guess, if you include this day, nine more days of 2020, And the deadline for the United Kingdom to officially leave the European Union to get a deal from the EU is fast approaching. The last day of the year is literally going to be the last chance. I think everybody in the UK knows that there will not be a deal. We are all hoping for one. Well, except the Brexiteers and a few others who stand to make millions upon billions of pounds on a no deal, courtesy of disaster capitalism. But for the rest of us who have a heart and a soul and a little less money, we are hoping, hoping and praying for a deal of some kind. This was a foolish exercise in the first place. A sadomasochistic exhibition all for a few people to make millions upon millions of pounds lorries in turmoil at Dover and nobody wants to allow the UK to go anywhere in fact that's what's so interesting to me is that Four and a half years of let's leave, let's leave, let's leave the EU has resulted in a disaster. And not only has the United Kingdom, not only have we not left the EU, it's all symbolism. It's only in name. It's symbolic. We are still begging the European Union to allow us to leave with a deal or without one. Knowing full well that This was never going to be either an easy or a clean break. And all of the language that you heard from the politicians in England in particular, particularly on the conservative side, specifically on the conservative side, amounted to a whole of bullcrap. And now, more than 30 countries have forbade flights to or from and to and from the United Kingdom. Given the break of this, this outbreak of this extremely serious new variant of the coronavirus, coronavirus COVID-19, that is spreading through Southeast England and London and the rest of England like wildfire. 
this is some kind of either cruel joke or a higher power's way of saying to the United Kingdom, you won't get out of here, out of this European Union, without paying some kind of price. I don't know that I personally believe that, but I just said it. But still, there is something tragicomic about what we're seeing now in the United Kingdom. And as Christina Patterson, who was with me here two episodes ago, was saying, is that this is a really bad thing. And the United Kingdom is toppling off a cliff right before our eyes. You can't fly in, you can't fly out. All of its allies have said no flights in to the UK, no flights from the UK, we don't want you here. It's the ultimate irony, isn't it? And this is just the start. We haven't even got to January 1st, 2021 yet. Welcome back. Last night in the House of Representatives, there was a vote on the stimulus bill that had been agreed to about 24 hours before. The bill, which is almost uh, 5,500 pages long, and I have actually linked to it in the liner notes of this episode. Good luck. If you have some insomnia, you might want to try to see if you can go through all 5,439 pages plus of this bill. Um, I wish you all the best with it. But in that 5,400 plus page extravaganza, which of course, um, well, look, if I can't get through 717 pages of Barack Obama's new memoir, and I've only got to page 23 or so, um, where do you think I might have got to with 5,439 or so pages of this bill? Where would you have got to? Last night on that 5,000 plus page extravaganza was a vote. The House of Representatives here in the United States voted on the bill last night. The bill passed 353 yes votes. Let me rephrase that. The bill passed 359 yes votes, 53 no votes and 17 congressional politicians not voting. In fact, all 17 of those were Republican. Two hundred and thirty of the 359 yes votes were Democratic. 128 of the yes votes were from Republicans. One of the yes votes was from an independent. As for the politicians in the House voting against this stimulus bill, which would bring 300 extra dollars of unemployment insurance benefits per week. Two Democrats voted against it and 50 Republicans voted against it and one independent voted against it. Makes me wonder if that's the same independent. Independent. It's interesting because I know that Justin Amash voted against it because he's an independent who votes pretty much against everything that ever gets brought up on the House floor. 
Justin Amash, by the way, wanted to or was exploring, had an exploratory committee earlier this year. I think it was back in the summer um, upon to decide whether or not he was going to run for the White House. And he decided not to do so, which was a wise decision in the end. It was a wise decision back then. So the vote again was 359 yes and 53 no. I'm just going to read to you just a few of the names who voted yes. And then I'm going to read to you a few of the names who didn't vote yes. Baragon, who is... uh, I think her name is uh, Nicole Barragon. I'm not sure what her first name is. Nancy Barragon. I don't know. <laughs> but she's from California. Um, she voted yes. And so did G.K. Butterfield. He is in the Congressional Black Caucus. He voted yes. Um, there are a number of other people. I mean, there's so many people here. Uh, it's It's remarkable. Um, the amount of, of names, and, and it should be. It should have been much more overwhelming even than 359 to 53. Um, Crenshaw, which uh, uh, um, I believe is the Republican out of Texas, who's originally from England, by the way. He is a war vet who lost his, um, lost his left eye um, in combat. Now, that's the same Republican that Donald, Tra- uh, Donald Trash, yeah, yeah, that Donald Trash um, absolutely insulted last week or the week before by saying, oh, Dan, I'm, I'm not sure I can see you. Usually you're so easy to find because he wears an eye patch. So let me make fun of him only having one eye and because he's so easy for you to to see. Donald Trash doing his trashiest. And look, look I'm no fan of Dan Crenshaw. Uh, he, uh, or is it Crawford? Anyway, which one of those guys? I think it's Crenshaw. But if it's if it one of those two, oh God, I am really off the off the ball today. Um, but my point is is that even he voted yes. He's from Te- he's in, he's a he's now um, a congressman in Texas, uh, having been born in England. Even he voted yes, Republican. Some of the other names you would expect, Val Demings voting yes, um, I think P- Peter DeFazio voting yes, another Democrat, and uh, of course you know that Val Demings is a Democrat, and Rose DeLauro from uh, Connecticut, Democrat votes yes. As you can imagine, um, all of these individuals, Republican um, diaz Balot in Florida voting yes, uh, Virginia Fox, Republican in North Carolina voting yes, John Garamendi, Republican in California, excuse me, Democratic uh, congressman in California voting yes. Greg Gianforte, this is the guy who body slammed a reporter, I believe from the Guardian newspaper. This was about two, three, four years ago. Greg Gianforte, body, body slamming a reporter from the Guardian newspaper. Seriously, I'm not kidding. And he is now a representative in Congress, a Republican, I believe from Colorado, and he voted yes for this stimulus bill. A few more names I just wanted to read to you so that you could just kind of get a a flavor of things. Uh, Debbie Lesko, a Republican, voting yes on this bill. Ted Lieu, a, a Democrat from California voting yes. I played some audio from Congressman Lou just a few days ago on the one-year anniversary of the impeachment of Donald J. Trump. Let's read some more names, shall we? Carolyn Maloney of New York voting yes. She's a Democrat. Sean Patrick Maloney, uh, I believe of Massachusetts, also voting yes. He's a Democrat. And then we go down the list, down the list, down the list. Jerry Nadler also voting yes. By the way, if I said no on <laughs> on Maloney, the two Maloney's both voted yes. In case I did not say that, I just want to make sure. I can't believe. I hope I haven't forgotten. 
Oh dear. Um, like I said, I'm off the ball today a bit, so bear with me. Um, <laughs> gosh, this this uh, this whole calendar year with this coronavirus, I'm telling you, um, this has not been an easy year to say the very least for any of us. So both the Maloneys voted yes to the bill. And Lucy McBath voted yes. And we will just continue to go down the list a little bit here. As I said, Jerry Nadler voted yes. Seth Moulton voted yes. He's the Democratic um, uh, veteran. Uh, I think he's an uh, Afghan uh, veteran of the Afghan war, uh, uh, you know, uh, Afghanistan. And maybe Iraq as well. Seth Moulton, Democrat from Massachusetts. And let's just go here. Uh, Jean Nagus from Colorado, the Democratic congressman who figured quite prominently in the uh, impeachment hearings last year, if you remember. Devin Nunez, the Republican from California. Oh, boy, oh boy, even he voted yes. Well, you know, he has a bit of a conscience, I suppose. And let me just finally go to the squad, of course. The squad, and you know who the squad is. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez voting yes. Elon Omar voting yes. Ayanna Presley voting yes. Now let's go to those who voted no here. 53 Congress people voted no. Matt Getz, Tulsi Gabbard. How about that? She ran for president this year. The Democratic candidate in the running. You had Justin Amash, as I said, who voted no, the independent. Um, And other names of note, James Sensenbrenner, Republican, voting no. And here's one of the names that really stands out for me is Rashida Tlaib of the squad also voting no. And, I, you know, I I think that's a really noteworthy one Um, because I kind of, as I've been saying repeatedly the last... uh, 24 hours, is that this bill is just so insufficient. And as I said, while people will be happy in the very, very short term, the people who really do need this money will be happy. Um, It's really not going to do very much of anything to help people beyond maybe a week. I mean, how far does $600 travel for the average person? So we'll see. I do believe in the idea that something is better than nothing. And I do believe that this is something. But as I said in yesterday's episode, we are the richest nation on the planet. The richest nation on the planet. And somehow, 300 additional dollars for unemployment benefits per week, along with a one-time $600 check for people making $75,000 and below, is all that this richest nation on earth can muster. You know, you can almost see why squad member Rashida Tlaib decided to vote no. Actually, that is a vote of conscience. We also have in the legislation uh, d- direct payments, which were not in the Republican bill, to America's working families. I would like them b- b- bigger, but they are uh, significant, and they will be going out soon. That was Speaker Nancy Pelosi on the House floor yesterday during the debate 
pursuant to the passing or prior to the passing of this bill that um, happened in the House last night and then followed by a vote in the Senate. Um, I will get to the Senate. Um, you know, I, oh, jeez, I'll, I'll get to the Senate. But I, I, it, I think what, what gets me is, I guess it's the theme of today's episode, which is, what if Congress was full of people who were poor and working class? What do you think would happen? I mean, assuming that we kept the same systemic structure exactly as it is, exactly as it is. Instead of having all of the millionaires like Nancy Pelosi, who apparently is worth over a hundred million dollars. I don't know how true that is, but it would not surprise me. She is not starving for food and she does not lack colorful mask wear or a lack of wonderful brooches and necklaces and lots of ice cream. She's she's very well off. I have nothing against people who are very very well off. What I have an issue with is people who are very well off, who have absolute contempt for everyone else who is not well off. Especially those who are poor and those who are working class. And I think that if anything... And this is just one example of it. If anything sums up the absolute contempt that the people at the top, at the higher echelons of government and society have for those who are more along the bottom, it is the comment that you just heard from Speaker Pelosi. The House Speaker of this country, who is the second in line to the presidency, said yesterday on that house floor, for those of you who didn't quite understand, that the $600 direct payment checks, and Lord knows when they will be coming to you if you are one of those in need, are significant payments. Quote, I would like them to have been bigger, but they are significant. This comment is the latest in a series of tone deaf comments from House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. And as I said to you yesterday, I think it's time for her to go as Speaker. She's done a very good job in some respects passing a lot of very important legislation. And once again, I will say that there are going to be people who listen to me say that and they will respond with, well, you know what? She knew that the Senate wouldn't pass this anyway. It's not the point about what she knew or what the Senate would or would not do. The point is, is that as Speaker, she has put through hundreds of, and hundreds and hundreds of pieces of legislation. And much of that legislation does help people who are poor or working class. Now, of course, the other thing is, is that a lot of those bills also slip in provisions and poison pens and pork that help out the rich and help out rich corporations who don't need help. That is what wheeling and dealing in Washington, D.C. is. And comments like the one that you just heard that express the, quite frankly, Marie Antoinette type of disdain for the classes below just typify the attitude of those in power. The vast majority of whom have no courage no political will, and no moral courage either. 
And while I wouldn't say that Speaker Pelosi is someone who lacks moral courage, I would definitely vehemently uh, go to bat for her on the idea that she lacks moral courage. I don't think she does. It's the political and it's the interests that people like Speaker Pelosi, and not just her, I don't want to sound like I'm picking on her, even though these last two episodes I have squarely focused on her. There are others. I've I've talked about Mitch McConnell as well. I've talked about uh, those individuals like Kelly Leffler, who, Georgia, you must vote out, and David Perdue in Georgia, you must vote him out. Those two people have super wealth, and both of them have been trading on the backs of dead people during this coronavirus pandemic. I mean, let's be real about that. Both of them are very wealthy. Speaker Pelosi also. And most of the people in Congress, there's a large number of them in the Congress, that's House and Senate, are millionaires or are very, very well off. I mean, that is not a secret. So when you hear that kind of a comment from Speaker Pelosi, doesn't that give you pause? And it actually brings me to the question that I asked, which was, what if everything's staying the same, that instead of having millionaires and billionaires in Congress, Kelly Leffler is the richest person in the entire U.S. Congress. As a senator in Georgia, an unelected senator, she has wealth beyond wealth. What if everyone in the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate was replaced by people who are making less than $50,000 a year? What if the people who populated the Senate here in the U.S. and the people who populated the House here in the U.S. were all poor and working class people. What do you think would happen to that stimulus bill last night? Do you think that the bill would have been passed months ago? Do you think that the bill would have been far more robust than a one-time payment of $600? Do you think that the extra unemployment amount of $300 would be a lot larger? Do you think that we have... Do you think that we would have been in a position where we would have had better provisions on a lot of items such as health care? My point is that laws get written by those who represent the interests that the laws are being written for. And that's what lobbying is. A lot of legislation is being written by lobbyists and has been for a number of years now. And so I think it is important to keep that in mind. That the attitude of someone who's making or who is worth more than $100 million and is making more than $200,000 a year in Congress, as the Congress persons do, many of them making over $200,000 a year, some of them making over $150,000 a year. I forget the exact amount. I think the speaker makes 200 and something thousand. The person in the White House makes uh, 200 and something thousand or 400,000 or whatever it is a year. Uh, You know, Donald Trump has deferred his salary and all of this, or so he says. And we don't really care about him because in 29 days time, he will be a thing of the past in Washington, D.C. and in the White House. 
So let's swat him to one side, shall we? But it really is a question that I'm asking, not for a gimmick. I'm asking it sincerely. What do you think will have happened or would have happened last night or months ago had there been poor people in Congress as legislators, as senators, as House members? What do you think would happen? Keeping the systemic structure the same. Notice I didn't say abandoning and getting rid of the capitalist structure or the um, systemic structure that's in place. I honestly really would love to hear from people. And on Twitter, I am at the popcorn, R-E-E-L. I also do have a Facebook page called The Politocrat. I haven't given out that page very often, but it does exist. And and some people do um, correspond there with me. And I do post things there. There will be some, a lot more postings on the Facebook page in the next day or so. Um, Need to catch up with a lot of content and um, things that uh, those who do look at the Facebook page, I think might appreciate. And you might too. I hope you do. One of the best ways to get in touch with me is on Twitter, at the popcorn, R-E-E-L. And what do you think? I mean, do you think that this would happen? Do you think that there would have been a direct payment of more than $600? I think there, you know, for the record, I think there would have been. The issue, I think, would be the structure, though, that governs all of this. Because if the system is still in the place and, and, and controlled by those who are wealthy and powerful, it would seem to me that those who are legislators could run the grave risk of being overridden by these powerful interests. Because if you do have poor and working class people as legislators in both the House and Senate, Who's funding these poor and working class people? If not the very wealthy system that orchestrates and props all of this up in the first place. Unless every politician ignores Citizens United, which is part of the structure too, by the way, the Supreme Court decision from 10 years ago, January the twenty. 20th or 21st of 2010. So we're coming up on the 11th year anniversary coming up, you know, just about a month from now of that fateful U.S. Supreme Court decision. One of the worst it belongs alongside one of uh, uh, the other worst in history from the Supreme Court. But if assuming that all 535 members of the House and Senate That's the combined number. I guess it's 435 in the House and 100 in the U.S. Senate. Assuming that none of them is funded by billionaires or foreign entities or anything like that, would their success at passing better legislation be at risk of corruption and influence by all of these very rich people who are still behind the scenes, whether it's the lobbyists who are doing the bidding of the very rich, whether it is the infrastructure that is run by rich people and wealthy families. I mean, is is that a realistic scenario? Is that a realistic Outlook. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm grappling with how to frame this particular inquiry. If you had all of the strictures in place, and you had all of that as it presently stands, military industrial complex in place, corporations at the helm and center of everything, but you had 435 
members of the House of Representatives and 100 members of the United States Senate, all making less than $50,000 a year, all of them being either poor or working class or both. Because you can be working class and poor at the same time. You can be working poor. But let's say that that was what was happening. Do you think that the stimulus payments would have been higher? Do you think that you would have got a much better bill? And do you think that, assuming all of these 535 politicians ignore the money from big corporations and the usual suspects like Big Pharma and Wall Street and all of these kinds of places, you know, the tech giants, Is that a complete fantasy scenario that I'm painting? Or is it something that actually is feasible? I want you to think about that for a few moments. And when I return, I think I'll answer my own inquiry. We also have in the legislation uh, direct payments, which were not in the Republican bill, to America's working families. I would like them been bigger, but they are uh, significant. Well, well, well. Oh, dear me. I, I, I don't know where to begin with that. Uh, I just really don't. Uh, it, just, it just gets me. And it... And that's why there would be a wipeout. Because that attitude that you just heard there from Speaker Nancy Pelosi yesterday, December 21st, 2020, on the House floor, it just symbolizes and typifies the kind of tone deafness that the rich have to the plight of people who are working poor and working class. To poor people overall. I mean, that's just so emblematic. And I don't know Speaker Pelosi personally. I don't know Madam Speaker Pelosi. I don't know her personally. I've seen her in person. Never met her properly in person. Seen her in person. Um, I could walk from from where I live to where she is. Um, You know, again, not for any... For those listening who are thinking, ooh, no, 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 nothing nefarious. That is not the way I roll here at all. I'm simply saying that Speaker Pelosi is a pretty darn devout Catholic. She's pretty darn serious about her faith. Um, Some people might chuckle when I say she's a devout Catholic, uh, although I do not intend any offense or it to be a joke of any kind. But she's pretty serious about praying and being prayerful. She said it many times. And she's saying this about people who are absolutely robbing you. I mean, it's a total, total robbery. And she's praying for them. When Donald Trump was impeached just over a year ago, and you can see the video of it, when she reads out the vote, she bangs down the gavel, someone cheers, and she gives fires off a real shop look at them, a real death, deadly stare at them. I would not want to be on the receding, receiving and receding. I would not want to be on the receiving end of that particular look that Speaker Pelosi shot at somebody who shouted out cheering, really, for that vote when that vote was announced, the result of it, that saw Donald J. Trump impeached. But where were the prayers when she made that comment about the significant $600 one-time direct payment check for a family? Where does that go for the average family? Where does that go for a family of four? Tell them that that payment's significant when they have health bills, health care bills to pay, 
when they are behind on their rent payments or their for or their mortgage and they're in danger of being foreclosed on and they've got bills stacked up you you tell them that tell them that that $600 is significant i i mean you remember i said this thing yesterday about wolf blitzer and her interview with him and um, they're back and forth and I feed them. I look at them. Do you feed them? Oh, well, $600, you know, it's a start. But it really is far from where we need to be. And so that's why my scenario of if you had poor people in Congress instead, in all of these positions, every one of the Speaker of the House making less than $10,000 a year, the Speaker, you know, or the majority whip making, you know, next to nothing, poor Poor, or as some people say in the black community, po. Holes out of donuts, and they are in Congress serving you, the people, serving the rich. I mean, and not I mean not representing their interests, but serving in the seat. And again, I know some people will say, yes, it is a wholly unrealistic thing. I suppose it it definitely is. Leaving a system intact as it is, with the rich governing it. While you have 535 poor people as legislators. Just, I mean, it wouldn't probably be feasible at all because of the very system that engulfs the 535. Even though those 535 would be able to pass bills like this in a pandemic. And the payments would be a lot higher than $600 the unemployment benefit payment will be much higher. All of these things would be much higher. And there'd probably be an additional check of, say, three or $4,000 a month. If you had working poor people as congressmen and women, congresspeople, you would see these payments be much more beneficial. But the issue is, is that I think that within one term, each of those 200, well, 535 people, well, in let's go to the House of Representatives, each of those 435 people would be out of office by the end of their term. Because what the rich would do, the very rich and the wealthy, the corporations, the corporate structure, because that, in my scenario, would stay in place. And what they would end up doing is spending billions of dollars with the same Citizens United U.S. Supreme Court decision in place. And they would spend billions of dollars on advertising on candidates to run against all of these people, including people in their own party, Republicans or Democrats. They would run richer versions of these people, but versions that would actually adhere to their interests during a pandemic. And I think that what would happen is voters would end up, incredibly enough, I think voters would end up voting out a lot of the people. Do you think that would happen? I mean, do you think voters would vote out all of these poor people in the face of massive amounts of money being spent to get rich ones to replace them after giving away giving away. It's it's our taxpayer money. It's not being given away. It's being recycled back to us. Returned to us, really, in the form of refunds with these direct payment checks. But if more of that were given to us by people who were poor, if more people who were poor actually got more money from people in Congress who were all poor as well, do you think that those poor people who vote would actually replace the poor people who've given them this money with richer people that they are being bombarded by advertising on and about? That would be an interesting social science experiment, wouldn't it? I think most of those people would go, but I think there'd be a large number of people who are poor who would stay there because of the monies that they're being given, right? Or would there be some boogeyman complex? Would there be this scare tactic, the Republican scare tactic that works so well on white voters, particularly white 
voters who are rich or poor who go for this crap and who are racist, obviously, because why would you vote against your own economic interest? And I think that same scenario could happen. That all you'd need for all 435 of these poor legislators in the Senate, or rather in the House, and then the 100 in the Senate to to go over a six-year period is for the boogeyman complex and for the appeals to racism and to the racist fears in some white people or many white people in the electorate and those kinds of deeply embedded things in the white voter that has them voting for Donald Tripe, Trump, Donald Tripe, yeah, that has them voting for Donald Trump two election cycles in a row, even with his handling, or I should say non-handling, of coronavirus. So there's something deeper there for those white voters who continue to vote for Donald Trump in two different elections. More of them voted for him than they did for the Democratic opponent. And in this election, more of them voted for him than did previously, knowing what they knew. So racism is definitely at the heart of this. There's no question about it. And I actually do think that that would probably still govern in a situation like this, to a degree. It would be a fascinating experiment, though, wouldn't it? Although I think, as I kind of vacillate back and forth to reach an opinion on this, I do think that given the fact that we have a pandemic and that's what is in place right now, a pandemic, I don't think that the campaign by the rich to get rid of all of these people in the House of Representatives through running rich candidates, running all this other stuff, I don't think it would work. I really don't. The system needs to change the bottom line. There needs to be an overhaul of it, a dismantling of it. Because I think at the end of the day, no matter how many poor people you put in to Congress, if the apparatus is being controlled by the rich, by the super wealthy, by the corporates, there's going to be a way that they will challenge and undo anything that these poor legislators pass through laws or through something else. And then they will turn around and run all these rich candidates against them, which is why we need to have an agenda to keep sustaining a push for changes and an eradication of a system. Because the rich write these laws and write these bills, these moderates and these Republicans and these moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans, they're all making lots of money. They represent rich interests, which is why the vast majority of the American public aren't happy with this stimulus bill. Because it's crumbs off the table. The rich are throwing crumbs at the American public. And even in my hypothetical scenario... And I'd love to hear what you think about it at the popcorn, R-E-E-L, on Twitter. Even in my scenario, you will still have rich people on the outside looking to subvert the process. And within two years in the House of Representatives, the rich would make a sustained push to absolutely get rid of every one of these 435 Congress people by running super rich, uber rich people and messaging all kinds of things. That's what would happen. The question is, would it be ultimately successful? That's my other question. Would the voters vote against their own economic interests in a pandemic? I don't think they would. Because it's a pandemic. Their lives have been torn asunder. They've lost people in their families. They've had coronavirus. Or they know someone who does. So this is really a very interesting question. Hypothetical or no, it's worth thinking about. It really is. I definitely think that this is not something to um, dismiss. But I do think that there needs to be fresh leadership in the Senate. That means you've got to vote for John Ossoff and Reverend Raphael Warnock in Georgia. Voting continues now. I urge you, if you're in Georgia, to vote. 
Do it now, please. Do not wait until January the 5th. Vote now. You can go to peachvote.com to get information on voting and absentee ballots and all kinds of things. Stacey Abrams, with her Fair Fight organization, does an excellent job. But I do think there needs to be a Democratic leadership in the House, excuse me, in the Senate. And there needs to be a change of the Speaker of the House. We need new leadership. We need McConnell out as the Senate Republican leader. We need him out of the majority leader of the Senate. And we need Speaker Pelosi to face a challenge for her speakership on January 6th. Because that's a big day. You've got the uh, uh, presentation of the Electoral College votes for the joint House, uh, joint session of the Congress on the same day. And you've also got the Speaker's election. And I think that the progressives need, as I said yesterday, to challenge Speaker Pelosi, who doesn't want to bring Medicare for all to a floor vote. How could you not? I think this is something worth fighting for. And I think that January 6th is going to be a very pivotal day. January 6th, 2021, very big day. We will also find out on that day whether or not there will be a Democratic-controlled Senate because we'll find out what the results are of the elections of John Ossoff and Reverend Raphael Warnock. So there is a lot to be looking at for January 6th, which would be exactly two Wednesdays from the swearing-in of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And I know there'll be people at the joint session on January 6th, like Matt Gates or Getz, or whatever he is, his name is, who will sit up there, the Republican, and challenge. But look, it's just symbolism and theatrics and performance. And the bottom line is is that it's going to be entered into the record and it will be affirmed and we will have the swearing in two weeks after that on Wednesday, January the 20th, 2021. So think about what I've said here about this scenario of having 435 poor people in the Congress, in the Senate, in the House, and, and, and also, you know, the one, and 100 more poor people in the Senate. How would things change? But particularly on the case of this stimulus bill and, the, and these payments, and how would it sustain itself? And would those members of Congress survive with a pandemic, with everything systemically exactly the same? That's really my focus here. And I hope that you um, think about it. I've kind of tried to wrestle with it, how it could happen and how long would those 535 people last politically in a system controlled by wealthy corporations and the uber rich. I'll be right back with a few closing thoughts. So a few final thoughts, just a few here before I bid you adieu, adieu. Um, The United States Senate also voted on this bill. And this is what they did last night. They voted on this stimulus bill, H.R. 133, United States-Mexico Economic Partnership Act. That's the name of the bill that has this stimulus package in it. 92 votes yes, 6 votes no. That's in the United States Senate with two people not voting. Mike Enzi and... Mike Rounds, I guess is his first name is Mike. Mike Rounds, I think. Both of them, both Republicans, Wyoming and South Dakota, respectively, they decided, oh, we're not going to vote. So they didn't. So here are just a few of the names who voted yes in the United States Senate on this stimulus bill. Lamar Alexander, a Republican who is retiring from the Senate. He'll be leaving next month. 
Also, Cory Booker, the Democrat in the Senate, of course, used to be the presidential, one of the presidential candidates. He ran for president um, this year uh, and last year and started his campaign in 2019. John Cornyn, the Republican from Texas, voted yes. Um, looking through the list here, Tammy Duckworth, the Democrat from Illinois, voted yes. Diane Feinstein, the Democrat from California, voted yes. Cory Gardner, who is the outgoing Republican senator from Colorado, he voted yes. So, you know, that shows, shows me something about Cory Gardner. You know, he could have voted no. He will be leaving the Senate within a month or so, within a few weeks, because he got defeated in his re-election bid by John Hickenlooper, who was the former governor, is the former governor of Colorado, and now is going to be taking a seat in the Senate come January the 6th or thereabouts. So there you have it. You know, um, Corey Gardner, I think, has a little bit of integrity there. I don't want to laud these people because it's not integrity to vote for something that people really need. And I know the media loves to exalt Republicans for saying something that everybody else knew, say, six months ago. And somehow when the Republican says it, it gets these huge headlines. <laughs> don't you notice that? And again, I've, I've tamped down watching any of this stuff at least for a few more weeks in the corporate news media on cable because they try to make everything that a Republican says that we have all been saying for six months or a year somehow profound when they say it. But when we say it, it's just, oh, and they don't even really cover it very much. But when Mitch McConnell says it, oh my gosh, this is the president-elect, said it last week, and the media is covering that you know, 24-7, I'm imagining. So anyway, you had uh, the outgoing Democratic Senator Doug Jones from Alabama voting for it. And that's good as well. I mean, look, Doug Jones should still be in that Senate. He's going to be replaced by somebody infinitely dumber and not very smart at all. Doesn't even know the three branches of <laughs> the United States government, which is funny, but not funny, because that's the case with lots of people in the country. When you don't have civics anymore and when you have textbooks that say that Rush Limbaugh is the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know that you need to have a better education system. And the education system has been defunded completely over the last 40 plus years. Cindy Hyde-Smith, she, uh, the Republican of Mississippi, who again defeated uh, Mike Espy for the second time inside of, what, three years or so. And she's the one who said that she'd love to sit in the front row, have a front row seat at a lynching. And that was very well met with a lot of votes in Kentucky from racist white people there. Excuse me, from Mississippi. Kentucky, Mississippi, you know, same difference. Kind of, you know. You know, she, so she voted yes. And let's go here. Kelly Leffler voted yes. Republican in Georgia who you have to vote out, folks, in Georgia. And David Perdue voted yes. Republican in Georgia. You have to vote him out there. Vote him out and vote in John Ossoff and Reverend Raphael Warnock. Voting is going on right now. Peachvote.com. Peach, P-E-A-C-H, V-O-T-E dot com. I'll link uh, that in the liner notes of this episode. And I will link these votes as well, um, both in the House and Senate, along with the bill in the episode. So you can read this for yourself and see these names. So those are some of the people who voted yes. Bernie Sanders, the Independent, voted yes. Um, Elizabeth Warren, Democrat, voted yes. Ben Sass, the Republican in Nebraska, voted yes. Mitt Romney, Republican in Utah, voted yes. Marco Rubio, the Republican of Florida, voted yes. So there you go. Those are just some of the people who voted yes. And I read out a number of Republican names. Pat Toomey, the outgoing Republican senator in Pennsylvania, he voted yes as well. Now here are the no votes, the six no votes. And damnation to each of you. Marsha Blackburn, Republican. Ron Johnson, Republican. You know, this is the Russian shell, Ron Johnson, who a few days ago on the Senate floor said no to $1,200. 
And he's chiefly responsible for why it's only $600 that you are getting. So Ron Johnson said, to hell with it. No, you're not going to get $1,200. You're going to get crumbs. This guy is such a shill for Russia. I wonder if he was a member of the legislature in Russia, in the legislature there. And I believe there is a Russian legislature. If he was a representative there, do you think he'd vote for more money for Russian people or less money for Russian people? What do you think about that? Hmm. Do you think he'd vote for more money for Russians than for Americans? And this guy is a piece of dung. Ron Johnson is dung wearing a American flag pin on a lapel. That is what he is. This guy is the pipeline to Putin. He is absolutely reprehensible. And Wisconsin voters have got to do better than this. And stop allowing these people to pollute you. What a piece of dung Ron Johnson is. And also that applies to Rand Paul, the Republican from Kentucky. He's the one who is still sitting on the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act that was passed way back in February of this year. And he's still sitting on it. Well, I need to see it. I don't like... Uh, uh, uh. This guy's up for re-election, I think, in a couple of years' time. Or whatever he is up for. I mean, he's got to go, Kentucky. Come on. Are you serious? Do you think you really think that this is the best you can do? Really, Rand Paul? It's bad enough you have Mitch McConnell. Oh, God, how do you do this every time and not be racist? You have to be racist to be electing these people. There is no question. Ted Cruz, no on this. No, you're not even going to get crumbs. That's Ted Cruz, the Republican in Texas. Mike Lee, the Republican in Utah. Oh, and I'm the originalist and originalism should prevail and we have to look at the text to find out what the founding slave enslavement owning fathers uh, said, what they meant. And originalism is the only way. That's Mike Lee. He voted no. You're not getting crumbs for Christmas. You can't even taste the crumbs. And Rick Scott of Florida, the Republican there. Mr. Medicare fraud extraordinaire. I mean, this guy committed so much crime and got nothing of consequence for doing so. He committed crimes. Defrauded Medicare. This guy was Mr. Medicare fraud. Everybody knew it. He was a Republican governor. That didn't stop him. Of Florida. And now the Republican senator in Florida. It's incredible. And I know it's money the interests and racist people who are voting for him. And he voted against you in Florida. So why would you keep re-electing Dung? Why would you keep doing that, Florida? Is it really because it's Florida? Or is it because you're racist? Or is it because you can't smell that Rick Scott is Dung? Your sense of smell has been so overridden. And you don't even have coronavirus, let's say. Let's say you as a voter in Florida don't even have coronavirus where you can lose your sense of smell. But because you have this filthy dung of a politician named Rick Scott, a criminal, basically, a guy who defrauded Medicare in his state, made off with millions, billions. Uh, but, you know, nothing happens to him. And then he votes against you, the everyday person in Florida. <laughs> dear, oh dear, oh dear. That you can still do that is a testament to your racism. And I think your ignorance as well. And I think, quite frankly, willful ignorance, which is much, much worse. Because we are all ignorant of something. 
my, my, my. Nobody told me there'd be days like these. Strange days indeed. Most peculiar, Mama. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. Thank you.